Okay, welcome everyone. It is the 28th virtual forum. ARCI has been doing this for quite a while now, and here we are in the middle of January, and I, I'd like to put out a warm welcome to everyone who's come in today, because it's really cold outside here in Northern Illinois. And uh, we've got members uh, checking in today, some new faces, and we've got members from all over the country different clubs uh, joining us today. So thanks to everyone who's tuned in today uh, to make these events so special. I'd like to uh, show you the three presentations we're going to have today up there on the screen. And uh, after that, I'll, I'll go through a, a real brief uh, protocol slide just to tell you what we do when we do these for some of you new members. But we've got three great presentations today. Um, Two of the presentations are by uh, participants who have done this before, and one is by uh, a new presenter. So we'll talk about that as it comes up. But our first presenter, uh, I'll get to in a second, as soon as I talk about the protocol here. It's, it's really pretty simple. Just stay on mute unless you have a question. That way the uh, audio stays kind of clean and easy to hear. Um, the chat window is a good thing to use if you have a question or you have some information you want to pass back and forth. And at the end of the uh, the session here, you can save that chat file. We also send that chat file out uh, through our, our mail uh, broadcast. So if you miss saving it, we, we can send that out at the end anyway. If you have any comments, please uh, pass them along to that email address there. And we do have four more of these scheduled this year. And we are, uh, as Matt said, we are recording these. The first presentation today is by Brian Belanger, who's the curator of the National Capital Radio and TV Museum in Maryland. And he's done three excellent presentations for us before. And the presentations are really in-depth and historical, and I'm sure you'll enjoy this one just, just as much as I've enjoyed all those prior ones. Uh, Brian, I'm going to hand it over to you now. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I joined uh, the Illinois Club uh, more than a year ago because my good friend Joe Coaster said, Brian, you really need to join that Illinois Club. They got a great publication. So I took his advice, and I'm glad I did. I've been enjoying uh, being a member. Anyway, the topic today is CONELRAD, which is an acronym for Control of Electromagnetic Radiation, subtitled Those Little Triangles on 1950s uh, Radio Dials. So let's get the next slide here. So here's a 1950s uh, GE, and the little arrows show you the little triangles at 640 and 1240. And by the way, uh, since uh, you folks are in Illinois, uh, Zenith uh, had some t uh, radios back in that era where in addition to the little triangles, they put a little dot on their FM radios where uh, Zenith had their Chicago FM station. So you might see a little dot for that. So let's go back and talk about a little history. Um, during World War II, there was something called the Ground Observer Corps. Uh, there were about a million and a half civilians who volunteered uh, primarily along the East Coast and the West Coast to stand out in the, in the rain and the sun uh, with binoculars watching for incoming German or Japanese airplanes. Now, fortunately, we were far enough away from Japan and Germany that uh, that wasn't a big problem, but you know, we didn't know whether it was going to be a problem or not. So if you, I remember listening to a 1940s Fibber McGee and Molly program where Molly said she had volunteered for this uh, Ground Observer Corps and she was urging all her listeners to do it. And uh, you can see the little... Um, a lapel pin that you could get for that. And uh, then when the war was over, that died out. But then in the 1950s, we were worried for Russian bombers coming to hit us with nuclear weapons. And so they once again organized a ground observer corps. So what was the reason we had Conrad? Well, we were, of course, very afraid uh, of a nuclear war with Russia during the Cold War. And at the time, the assumption was that if they were going to launch an attack, they would get their big bombers coming over the North Pole, flying at very low altitudes to come in under the radar screen. And in order to find their targets, even in bad weather, the idea was that they would have direction finding equipment, could home in on a broadcast station, because of course they knew where all the broadcast stations were located, 
and even in the fog or whatever, uh, with their direction finding equipment, they could uh, hit their targets. So the conclusion was, if there's going to be a Russian attack, we got to turn off the radio and TV transmitters. And that was the rationale for Conrad. It was announced by President Truman in 1951, and uh, the idea was that these stations would leave the air. However, there were some stations that would stay on the air called key stations um, that would provide civil defense information, and they would be on 640 and 1240 on the AM dial, and they would um, switch between stations so that uh, the Russians wouldn't know who it was that was broadcasting at any given time. And uh, they would like, uh, the idea was they would switch like every couple of minutes. So, so you really couldn't use direction finding. And there would, uh, the key stations would be connected with telephone lines so that they could uh, coordinate their activities. So there was a lot of publicity about this. Uh, I'm old enough to remember very clearly uh, 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 ads like the one here uh, in magazines and newspapers. And they used to have little jingles on the radio that I remember, 640, 1240, Conrad, 640, 1240, Conrad. And so everybody was supposed to remember, in case of emergency, tune your radio to 640 or 1240. Well, what about the hams? Well, at first, the hams weren't involved in this, but um, after a while, uh, the emergency planners realized that uh, if the broadcast stations were off the air, the Russians could get a copy of the uh, ham radio call book and they could uh, tune in on a ham radio transmitter and they knew where the hams were located. So they decided they had to have the hams go off the air too in case of an emergency. And Heathkit being uh, quick to respond came out with this Conlorad alarm kit model CA1 sold for $13.95. And the idea was you plug your transmitter into this and it would be monitoring a local station. And if that station went off the air, uh, a red light would come on and it would switch your transmitter off. A few people purchased that. My experience was that most of my ham friends did not. Uh, there were alternates. You could um, leave an AM radio playing softly in the background, and then if it went off the air, you'd know there was a problem. Uh, in my case, uh, I lived in a little town near the Canadian border in Minnesota, and I figured that um, the Russians were unlikely to bomb my hometown of a couple thousand people, so it probably wasn't so critical for me. So sometimes I ignored it, although usually I would ask my mother to leave the radio and on and tell me if there was a problem. Here in the DC region, uh, station WTOP was one of the important stations in town. It was a CBS outlet. And its chief engineer, Granville Klink, uh, worked there like for 50 years and had a set of scrapbooks that he kept with all sorts of clippings and stuff about the station. And we got access to those which had a lot of information because he was one of the key people working with the government and planning this whole system. Um, because it was close to the White House, uh, it was one of these key stations, not only to be on the air, but also to sort of coordinate with other stations around the country. So here in the DC region, there were um, five 640 kilohertz and five 1240 kilohertz stations that were selected as key stations. And they were supposed to switch at two minute intervals. Well, once in a while they would have a test, but uh, my understanding was that it, they never really uh, did a serious test of this switching at two minute intervals. So would it have worked or not? Who knows? Uh, if you were a commercial station, you could buy something like this. This is an RCA Conrad receiver. It was used by Baltimore station WBJC. And it's basically the same thing as the Heathkit thing. You'd have it uh, monitoring a station, and if the station went off the air, an alarm would sound, and you had to turn off your transmitter. Uh, here was a uh, cassette tape that was used for these regular messages uh, that were played saying, you know, uh, in case of emergency, tune your radio to those frequencies. Well, Conrad eventually ended, and the reason was ICBMs, because... Um, once you had inertial guidance ICBMs, there was no need for direction finding. And so uh, when it became clear that if there was a nuclear attack, it would not be with bombers, it would be with ICBMs. And so at that point, you didn't need to keep the system in place. But they realized it was still good to inform citizens about what to do in emergencies. So uh, the government developed a, a replacement for Conrad, an emergency broadcasting system. And the uh, the EBS uh, 
uh, where had stations authorized to broadcast emergency. They were com common program control stations. But all the radio stations still had to have an EBS receiver. And in this case, the uh, signal was if a 20 second burst of audio tones was received, uh, the special radio would detect that and an alarm would go off. And the non-CBC stations had to monitor a CB station. And here's an example of a Motorola uh, receiver for that. There were a few false alarms. Uh, in the uh, 1950s, uh, there were a couple of cases where somebody started the wrong message and then immediately realized and corrected it before any damage was done. Um, in 1971, uh, NORAD headquarters, uh, some incompetent employee stuck the wrong tape in the machine uh, in what was just to be, uh, supposed to be a routine test. But since the mistake occurred at the regular scheduled time, most stations assumed it was a false alarm and ignored it. <clears throat> Here's a little cartoon. It says, this has been a test. Had this been an, an actual emergency, you can bet your booty I wouldn't still be here talking into this microphone. So what do we have today? Well, over the last few decades, the system has evolved and been upgraded a number of times. Uh, in 2012, there was a new emergency alert system uh, and today, uh, FEMA is in charge because today, uh, the main reason for having this is like tornado warnings. And so you'll still um, hear on your radio tornado warnings uh, from this emergency alert system that we have today. So if you ever come across a radio that's got triangles at 640 and 1240, uh, you'll know for sure it was from the 1950s during the Conrad era. Now, since we're talking about radio subjects, this morning, uh, and if I have a few minutes left, I'm going to uh, do a little commercial here. Um, as you heard, I'm involved at the National Capital Radio and Television Museum in Bowie, Maryland. Um, we've been called one of the 10 best museums in the state of Maryland. It was founded by the Mid-Atlantic Antique Radio Club. Uh, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. Um, we've had visitors from all 50 states, 30 foreign countries. We have a big library, thousands of books and magazines. We have a restoration shop, and we teach classes in radio repair. We're open three days a week, Saturday, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But uh, my fellow club members, if any of you are going to be in the D.C. area and want to visit on a day when we're not open, uh, give me a call or an email a couple of days before, and I'll make a special opening and give you the deluxe tour. Um, it's only 25 bucks a year uh, to do, uh, become a member. We publish a quarterly journal called Dials and Channels with lots of interesting articles. Uh, every other Wednesday night, we have a lecture uh, via Zoom. In fact, what you're hearing this morning is one of those lectures. And next month, I'll be doing one about History of Atwater Kent. Um, and of course, we're helping to preserve radio and TV history. So I would encourage you to consider joining. And I will stop sharing and try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Brian. That was excellent. Fascinating stuff. Lots of detail there that uh, I had no idea. And uh, for those of you uh, watching this, uh, the first presentation that Brian did back in uh, July of 2021 is on our website on the uh, Arky uh, YouTube channel, where he actually takes us through a tour of the museum. So. Uh, if you want to tune in to Herky's YouTube channel and go to July of 2021, you can you can tour the museum. So I have a question, Tom. So Brian, the uh, it, it was a network of the Colorado. So it was a the the transmitting stations that would rotate every two minutes were networked, and uh, I'm assuming to a single announcer or. And then they would simply rotate transmitters. Was that the? My understanding is that uh, there were the national announcements, like if there was a you know uh, a nuclear attack uh, uh, or something like that, that would be a national announcement. But then there was also an opportunity for for local announcements uh, if there was uh, you know some particular danger, say at a particular city, that they could uh, handle that with those local stations. But it was all networked with telephone lines. AT and T provided the uh, secure connections to get all the stations coupled together. Okay, so it wasn't just like a very slow frequency hopping spread spectrum approach, or sorry, 
uh, transmitter hopping <laughs> spread spectrum approach. Yeah. Uh, any of you, any of you have one of those uh, Heathkit uh, Conrad monitors? They're pretty rare. Never seen one. Um, I uh, don't have a Con uh, Heathkit. I have one by Car Engineering, which um, is a Conrad monitor, and it uh, was more. It was more like an industrial type device, probably used for um, schools or something like that if they needed to, to monitor Connell Red. But it had an alarm system and, and it was quite elaborate uh, and uh, quite a nice system. Brian, uh, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, I When I was in college, I worked at a station that broadcast on 1240. So I'm wondering, when uh, Connell Red was uh, intended to be activated, would the would the emergency announcements come from stations already set up to transmit on six forty and twelve forty? How did how did uh, that work? Well, in many cases, uh, the key stations uh, might not have been on one of those frequencies, so they'd have to modify their transmitter to have a big switch that they could switch to change to the uh, one of those frequencies if they were a key station. So the key stations weren't necessarily on either one of those frequencies on the regular operation. Thank you. Very good presentation again. Hey, Brian, it's Bill. Hi, Bill. I, I have a comment and a question. Uh, I too had to do the duck and cover. First, it was put your butt to the windows of the school classroom. And then they started putting us in the halls and it made it really um, believable to me one day. Uh, our school was located on a main route out of Washington into suburban Maryland to Andrews Air Force Base. And one day while out in the parking lot playground, I saw a convoy go by, Air Force convoy with a flatbed trailer and fat man sitting on the trailer. Now, I don't know if it was a display model or the real thing, but I can't imagine why they would have needed a tractor trailer to haul a dud or something of the sort. But that made our air raid drills uh, pretty real for me as a kid. I also wondered um, if the station ceased using uh, call sign identifiers during any proposed broadcast during an emergency in that period. No, there were no callers mentioned. They would just say, uh, you know, this is the uh, Conrad station and here's the announcement. So no, no station identification. Thanks. Well, if there were no more questions, I'd be eager to hear the next speaker. Well, I, I just got a just a little brochure here that um, I don't know if you can see that on there. Is that coming through all right? Yeah. yeah. In time of an emergency, it's a, a 92 page booklet on basically what to do in case of a nuclear attack that was uh, delivered to my delivered to my grandmother uh, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. They lived um, in an apartment type complex just down the street from Remington Arms, which was a munitions manufacturer back in the day. But uh, just kind of on the topic of it, there's not really a chapter in there about Conrad. It's more about you know, prepping and uh, fallout shelters and how to store food and things like that and, and how to listen to the air raid sirens, but it doesn't actually measure the Conrad itself. But anyway, just since we're kind of on the topic of emergencies. All right. Thanks for that comment, John. And yeah. at this point, I'll thank Brian again and uh, hope that some of our members can get out there to visit your fine museum. So... Thank you very much, Brian. And with that, I'll move us on to our second presenter, Alan Gard, who is a first time presenter to our virtual forum. And Alan is a relatively recent member to ARCI, and you may have seen him around at the swap meets. And he provides a very valuable service to us lately as he brings the coffee and donuts. So you might want to be in good with him if you need an extra donut. So uh, Brian's going to talk about a 1920 set that he restored. And so with that, I'll turn it over to, to Alan. Sorry. So heavy metals, 1920 style. 
restoring an RCA radiola 64. I acquired the radio about 45 years ago, so it's taken me a little while to get around to restoring it. Uh, the radio was sold only for about two years. Uh, it was reputedly the first commercially available home radio with automatic volume control, a tuning meter, and a sensitivity control to minimize static and other electrical disturbances. Uh, essentially, that was just a pot on the uh, antenna connection. It was priced at about $600, uh, which works out to almost $11,000 in today's dollars. And that may be the reason why there was only about 7,400 units made. So at the looking at the back, uh, general configuration, speaker at the top. There's a receiver unit in the middle, and then what they called the socket power unit at the bottom. And this is one heavy radio. The speaker is 29 pounds, receiver weighed in at 14, and the socket power unit at 53, which adds up to about 96 pounds. And then you have the cabinet on top of that. So for this radio, uh, RCA repurposed a Radiola 64 rece uh, 60 receiver unit, and they took what was the 71 audio tube, audio output tube, moved it down to the socket power unit, replaced it with a UX250, and that uh, 71 tube there then became a uh, the AVC tube. So in restoring it, I gave the radio once over to determine whether it was possible to restore. Now these, uh, from what I've read, these units were prone to burn out of the power transformer, but it was good on my unit. Uh, the input transformer for the UX250 had been replaced with a Stancor A63, which had an open winding. Uh, several wire wound resistors in both the receiver and the SPU were open. There were a few other resistors out of spec. The grill cloth had a tear, which my wife later told me that she actually did that. Uh, then the tuning meter winding was also open. But other than that, everything else looked good. And the 250 tube was good, which was encouraging. So for the input transformer, it's supposed to be a brown metal box uh, sitting next to the UX250. Uh, what I actually found was this little A63 sitting on a piece of Bakelite, which may have been the original bottom of the input transformer. Um, and as I mentioned, it had open windings and it just looked too small and lightweight for this radio. So fortunately, I was able to get a hold of an Electroprint 3634 which weighed in at several pounds, nice and heavy. Uh, and uh, that was the replacement I put in there. On the wire wound resistors, there's two big multi-section wire wound resistors. And then in the center is the capacitor bank. Um, I was uh, not certain whether these were any good, but I didn't want to take the chance. I wanted to just replace them. Um, and several unit, parts of the resistors were bad. So you see here, there's a big wiring harness that comes down and splits off to the various caps and resistors. Uh, that was big and stiff. Uh, wiring insulation looked somewhat fragile. So I wanted to come up with a method that would minimize how much I was moving those wires. So for the resistors, I didn't know what wattage they were supposed to be. Uh, it was an unknown current. So I knew that the top end was the plate vol uh, voltage for the UX250. So basically add up the resistor chain, estimate the current at about 60 milliamps. And then for each resistor, I calculated a wattage. And just to be on the safe side, when I ordered the parts, 
I doubled the wattage. So I took the new resistors and soldered them onto a U-style terminal strip. And down here, I used some of the unused tabs to solder to the tabs off of the old resistor. And that gave me a good mounting point for these resistors. And also by using the double lug, I could solder the resistors in place and then solder the wires to the remaining lugs in a location that was close to where it was before, but I wasn't trying to fiddle with the wires and the resistors at the same time. For the cap replacement, uh, these are the tabs coming up. I covered them in heat shrink tubing to prevent any electrical contact with any repairs. And I took another double barrier strip and soldered uh, replacement caps in about the same configuration as the diagram that came out of the service notes. So with this gap here, I was able to flip this over and push this to be on either side of the tabs and then solder the wires back into place. And these uh, the slow stick tape, when I took the wires off, I marked them so I knew what wires went where. So here is shown is the finished assemblies. There's the cap assembly in the middle, and then the two sets of resistors on either side. And with the cap assembly, I didn't have a uh, hard point uh, mounting like I did with the resistors, but I found that by putting it over on either side of the uh, capacitor, old capacitor tabs, and the stiffness of the wires. Once I did that, it was fully secure, didn't need additional support. I ended up doing a similar type of repair with the resistor unit that was in the receiver. The receiver also has a box uh, filled with bypass caps. Again, I didn't trust them, wanted to replace them. So I made up a small breadboard assembly with uh, the new caps, and I place it inside a little plastic box from Joanne Fabrics, and that gave me basically an insulation so I could mount this underneath the chassis in amongst all the other parts. Fortunately, there was enough room for that. Uh, soldered it into place, and then the original wires I had left where they were, where they disconnected from their connections, and put heat shrink tubing over it and left marking on there so I knew what wire was what. For the speaker cloth, uh, there's the tear in the lower right corner. The material is way too fragile to try any sort of repair, you know, putting something on the back side or whatever. Um, also, getting the cloth straight with this curved top and bottom, I thought it was gonna to be tough to stretch the cloth and um, get it straight at the same time. And if you notice here, the pattern sort of swoops up on the right side. So even the factory was having trouble with that. So to, I took a piece of book binding card uh, stock and cut a square out of it, and then on the inside, cut the opening for the speaker. I taped the cloth uh, face down onto a flat surface using some masking tape. That allowed me to stretch the cloth, get it straight. Then I also took tape and put it along either corner on the cloth. So I had four corners located where the cardboard would go once I put in the adhesive. So sprayed the far side of this cardboard with adhesive, put it down, press it into place, then sprayed the near side, masking it off. You can kind of see where the masking was. Folded the cloth over, that locked down the out, uh, perimeter and also uh, keeps the cloth from spraying, uh, fraying. Then I screwed that onto the back side of the cabinet and I'm pretty pleased with the result nice and straight. Uh, it came out pretty well. 
So the tuning meter is in line with the plate circuits of the RF and IF tubes. <clears throat> Those consist of four 27 tubes, so about 20 milliamps max current. The way the circuit is set up <clears throat> between the volume control and the volume, the automatic volume control, a weak signal will create more gain in the RF and IF ampli uh, amplifiers, so therefore more current. So this meter is essentially a reverse current meter. Zero on the current meter would be about 20 milliamps plate current, and 10 would be zero milliamps. So as I mentioned, the winding was open. Uh, I didn't want to chop apart the coil because I wanted to preserve the original. As you can see, the winding is embedded, so I had no way to determine how many turns, the gauge of the wire. Uh, I, I knew the outside physical dimensions. Uh, it had to fit between these two posts. It had to fit around this post. Uh, so obviously I needed to make a new coil, uh, but you know how to go about doing that. So I wanted to make sure that the meter movement was actually working. So I made a 100 and about 140 turn hand wound coil to verify that the meter worked. Fortunately, it did. So then I proceeded with working on uh, a newer coil. As you can see, the coil center is rectangular in shape, about 90 thousandths by 30, 350 thousandths. So I can't use a standard coil bobbin. Uh, I also don't have a coil winder. Uh, while I'm winding, I don't have a, a way to measure the number of turns. I figured there was going to be several thousand based on the hand wound coil. Uh, but I do have a Variac, a drill motor, sewing machine bobs, bobbins, and popsicle sticks. So I use the Variac to control the drill motor to spin at about 30 RPM so I could watch it through the magnifying lens. And I found 30 RPM was slow enough that I could watch and correct the position of the wire in most cases, but it was fast enough that I could do it, uh, wind up a coil in about two to three hours. The first and second attempts that I made, I tried using making a bobbin out of a sewing machine bobbin. So I modified the bobbin into a D shape to fit on the outside post and cut the inside to fit around also the rectangular post. But there were two problems here. One was <clears throat> that the only bobbin I could find had a 3 8 gap between the sides and the original was a half inch, <clears throat> excuse me. And also by the time I cut the opening in the middle, uh, there wasn't much left of plastic between the two, so the bobbin was really fragile. Uh, but I tried anyway, used 34 gauge wire. Basically, I just put on as many turns as I could to fit with, uh, inside the between the two posts. But I found that I needed about 85 to 100 milliamps to get zero on the meter. So obviously I needed more windings, but I had no more room. So I needed to use a finer gauge wire. So for my third attempt, I used 38 gauge wire. I took a popsicle stick and filed it so that it just was snug inside the opening of the original coil. And then I wrapped wax paper around that and then heat shrink tubing and uh, shrunk the heat shrink tubing while it was on the popsicle stick. Using the wax paper allowed me to slide the uh, heat shrink back off again uh, afterwards. And this was good to give me the smallest inside diameter that I could that had a good uh, insulation. I was concerned if I tried doing anything thinner or with something that was liable to tear when I was pushing it on the metal, I could end up shorting windings on the coil. So I took another uh, sewing machine bobbin, cut it in half, filed the inside so that they were snug fits. Now I could spread them apart so that I got the half inch width. And then since I was planning to use 
some uh, adhesive while I was doing the winding to lock windings in place. I put cellophane tape on the inside of the coil bobbin faces so I knew I would be able to pull that off again. I wasn't going to glue the uh, windings onto the bobbin faces. So I periodically applied cyanoacrylate glue to the windings to lock everything in place. Uh, sometimes uh, it just got a little away from me. So I ended up stopping the motor and backing up, redoing the windings, or in some cases, it was just getting too, too much that I didn't wanna pull back the windings that far. So I would stop the motor, just fill in the gaps with some cyanoacrylate, cyanoacrylate glue, and then uh, cover with a layer of cellophane tape. And that gave me a new, even smooth profile to start over, so, sort of to keep going. Once I got as big a coil as I could, uh, I soldered on lead wires and then epoxied those lead wires to the outside of the coil to give myself uh, some strain relief there. So when I tested it, I found that 28 milliamps gave me zero on the meter and I needed 20, but I figured that was close enough. Now on the next slide, there's a video showing the operation of the meter. We start off with the radio tuned away from a station and the volume control at the minimum. The meter is up at 10, but if I increase the volume looking for a station to see what I can hear a station, you can see that the tuning meter drops down towards zero. If I now tune into a station, you can see the tuning meter has gone up towards 10 and adjusting the volume control doesn't make much of a difference. is a pretty good performer, as you can hear, it's able to pick up music from the 1920s. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Alan, that was excellent. Very good. <laughs> Boy, that was uh, quite an effort rebuilding that coil. That, a lot of detail in that presentation, but a lot of really good tips. Thank you. Anyone have uh, questions for him? No question, but a comment that uh, 45 years, it was sure worth the wait. The thing is fantastic. Yeah, it really sounds pretty good. We, uh, on Saturdays, we listened to WDCB, uh, When Jazz Was King. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I end up, I have a little AM transmitter, so I stream it off of my phone into the AM transmitter and then listen to the radio. Yeah, 45 years. What what uh, what prompted you to touch it after 45 years? Well, it's uh, Tom Kleinschmidt's fault, actually, <laughs> because I had a, a number of radios and I was thinking, you know, they've been sitting around for so long. I've got stuff that, um, you know, what am I going to do with it? So I found about out about the Archie Club contacted Tom and said, I'd like to donate some stuff. So I went and saw uh, Tom at his house, brought the stuff over. And while I'm talking with him, he said, you know, it's not that difficult to repair some of these 1920s radios. So that made me think, hmm, maybe I shouldn't be donating any all of this stuff and in, instead start working on my radios. So I'm glad I did. That's great. It's good you can blame Tom because he's not here today. So right, but we'll pass that along to him. That uh, his efforts led to a great presentation, and we look forward to your next one, Alan. And I'm sure you've got something on the on the uh, workbench there that's uh, going to be a good story. Alan, I just wanted to ask: Was this your first restoration? No. Um... 
I did a couple of three dialers. Uh, I have a Walbert Special 6, uh, a Grebe uh, MU1, uh, a couple of others. Uh, so I, I sort of started off with easier stuff that was battery operated before starting to mess around with something that was putting out four, five, six hundred volts. So well, I congratulations. Uh, it's a beautiful job. And uh, thanks for all the detail about the work you did on the meter. That was that was very creative, very impressive. Thank you. Agreed, Alan. And and I have a question for you. Yeah. Were you like we will, you, will your wife let you have uh, another console or two in your house? <laughs> She actually, we were driving over to watch a silent movie. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen them around here. There's a guy, Jay Warren, who does organ accompaniment to the silent movies. So as we're driving, she said, hmm, she could think of three places where I could possibly put a console radio. Of course, my eyes lit up at that point. So she's since clarified that she meant three places for one radio, <laughs> but I've now managed to get her to say, well, maybe two radios. Excellent. That's a great story. Well, thanks again, Alan, and, uh, and thanks again for uh, working the coffee and donuts at the Swap Meets. Appreciate that. Yeah. Very welcome. Okay, our next presenter, Bill Ballad, has done uh, previous presentations for the virtual forum. In fact, he's done three, and they've all been excellent. And today, we're going to hear about some of his uh, encounters with some different radio architectures. Bill? Variations on AA5, All-American 5, of course, is what we're talking about. Um, I basically... Um, spend some time every every week working on radios that people bring in for repairs and these are some of the radios i've run across and interesting questions we'll cover five different radios a just as a a basis for the all-american five the halicrafters s38 and then a detrola 104 which came in uh stuart warner um which also is a little bit different a philco um, which I'll get into later, and, and a GE. We've got our, our, our Halicrafters. The Halicrafters S38, I chose. Um, can we go to the next slide? The S38 is Halicrafters bottom of the line, and that that is a typical All American 5 radio. Um, in the way the circuit is laid out. And basically it's five tubes. If you if you look at the schematic, which is up now, you'll see that along the top of the schematic, there are four tubes. That's the um, first tube is a uh, um, converter tube, uh, which brings the signal in and also generates the uh, local uh, oscillator and combining the two together to create the IF signal, which then is fed into the second tube, uh, another tube. Um, the, well, the first is a 6SA7, then, uh, excuse me, 12SA7, 12SG7, and that's the IF amplifier. Third tube is the detector. Um, it's a uh, 12SQ7, and then finally a 50L6, which is the audio output tube. Those are all in a, in a line on top. And then down on the bottom of the schematic is the power supply, um, which is a 35Z5. And um, if we look at the very bottom of that, you'll see that there's a, a string of um, filaments, the series, all series lined together. The idea being that you can um, hook up the filaments directly to the power line. Uh, if you add up the numbers on the on the, uh, the tubes, um, the first number in, in the tube is is the voltage of the uh, the filament voltage. So that what you end up with are three 
12 volt tubes, one 35 volt tube and one 50 volt. That adds up to be about 120 volts, which happens to be the power line voltage. Coming in with the, 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 the next set, the Trilla 104E came in, uh, and this one threw me for a loop. Uh, the cabinet shown here in the picture is not the one that, um, that mine arrived in, but the chassis is correct. It uses um, four tubes, and it's not a super heterodyne radio, but rather a tuned radio frequency. Um, there's a uh, move to the next slide. We can see the, um, you see the tube lineup. There's a 66, which is a RF amp and then a detector 6C6 and then a power output tube, which is a 43. That's a 25 volt filament. And then finally the rectifier, which is 25Z5. And if you look on the bottom of the schematic, you'll see that there's the four tube filaments are in a line. And then to achieve the 110 volt um, power line voltage, you need to add some resistance. And that is uh, shown as 165 ohm resistor in series, and also a 23 ohm, which uh, provides a voltage drop for the, the dial light. The, um, the interesting thing about this radio is that the um, 163 ohms is not a, um, a part in the, in the chassis, but rather a um, series, a, a, a third wire in the power line um, where it shows it connected to the 110 volts on the uh, hot side. Um, there's actually a nichrome wire that runs down the power cord. Uh, we've, I've heard them referred to as curtain burners. Uh, the power cord would actually heat up a bit as the power was dissipated um, in the uh, in the in the in the uh, in the uh, resistor wire. Uh, you needed to reduce about 15 vo 15 watts of power needed to be uh, dissipated in the power line. Now, when I came to repair this, of course, I didn't have a replacement for the power line or for the cord. So I had to add a resistance, um, which I had to bolt onto the back of the chassis, uh, no place to put it under the chassis. And it got a little bit warm. Uh, 15 watts was, is quite a bit of power to, to send out. Let's, next radio is a Stuart Warner 732. It's a three tube radio. Let's move on to the circuit. In this case, it's a 12 volt tube, 12 SA7, which is the pentagrid converter. Um, the second tube is a 25D8, which is a very strange tube. It's a multi-purpose tube. It has a IF amplifier. Um, it also has um, a diode and an RF amplifier all stuck in one little, one little bit. Um, and then f the final tube is a 70 L6. So they're dropping 70 volts in that filament, uh, 25 volts in the 25 volt tube and 12 volts in the 12 SA7. All three wired together in series, uh, again, connected to the hot side of the power line. And a, uh, to achieve uh, the proper line voltage or proper current, through these things, there's a um, series resistor in, in, in series with that. That was actually a resistor on the chassis, um, uh, which drops the voltage down to the proper level. This um, allows a, a fairly small tube count, um, but at the same time, it becomes rather warm inside the cabinet. Now let's move on to the next radio. This is a Philco console. It's a, actually a radio phonograph combination. And this one is a rather strange uh, setup. Let's move to the circuit now. It uses um, loctal tubes, which are 
six, uh, six volt Loctal tubes. Um, the XXD, which is a uh, Philco, special Philco tube that they uh, incorporate in some of their early 1940s uh, receivers. Uh, the next is a 7B7, that's a, 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 a pentode, and then uh, a 7B7, another series tube, and then um, a detector, and um, that was the 7C6, that's the detector and first audio, and then finally a 50L6 output tube. So what they're doing here is combining... Uh, four loctal tubes, that's the tube base, and then a, a, um, uh, an octal 50L6. Also on the same chassis is a um, rectifier, a 50Y6, which is shown down sort of on the bottom of it, on the um, right-hand side of the bottom, and then on the left-hand side of the bottom, there's another 50L6. Strangely enough, it's a 50L6, which is used as a preamp on the phonograph circuit. So they're using um, several different tubes. If you look down on the bottom of the uh, bottom near the rectifier tube, you'll see the series filaments. Um, this set is not listed as an AC-DC set. It's listed as an AC set, um, probably because the phonograph needed AC for the motor on the phonograph. But the, um, the, the wiring of the filaments is basically your, your, your ACDC, All-American 5 type wiring, except we have two strings of filaments. Um, one uses 250 volt um, tubes, the uh, two, 150L6 and the um, 50Y6 are in series, and then two of the... Um, six volt tubes are in series with that. So that's 112 volts. And on the other filament string, there's a series resistor and then two filaments, uh, uh, 50 L6, and then two of the uh, six volt or two of the six volt filaments. So what you've got are two separate strings of, of filaments. Now, the interesting part, what I found interesting about this set is that the set shown here um, is a uh, is there is one of two versions of this set that came out in 1940, uh, 41, I should say. The set that we saw before, the code 121, uh, used a, um, uh, a a permanent magnet speaker. Now that's a magnet. That's a speaker without a field coil, but with a magnet that is permanent. Uh, this particular circuit is a modification of that set to use a field coil. And what they did was inserted a second 50L6 tube um, as a rectifier. You know, if you look on the on the right hand side, the 50L6 is set up as a rectifier. All the all the elements are tied together um, and and uh, connected to the to the plate, so that it's really not being used as an amplifier at all. It's used as a rectifier in series with the field coil, which is labeled eighty two here. Um, if you look at the filament string, there are two filament strings, as there were in the other set. Um, in this case, uh, there's no series resistor, just two fifty L six tubes uh, in each string and then uh, 50Y6 in the bottom string, and then the um, uh, RF tubes in, in series with those. Um, and I think this represents a, um, the influence of World War II. Alnico um, permanent magnet speakers um, probably became very difficult to get in 1941. Um, I should mention the radio is listed as a, as a 1942 set, but the, the uh, model year for, for Philco started in, in June of 1941. And this set was manufactured in 1941. There were no sets manufactured in 1942. Alnico became difficult to get in the middle of 1941. Um, so they couldn't use uh, the permanent magnet speaker anymore. They had to use a, a field coil speaker. 
um, in the set. So they, they had to make this modification to the 122 um, code. Um, the Alnico code disappeared because it was needed for magnets and magnetron tubes for radar sets, which by 19, by the middle of 1941, when this set was, was probably manufactured, uh, they couldn't, um, you couldn't get Alnico anymore. It was being used uh, by the, by the military. Next set. Okay. This is a GE X4457. This is a little bit strange. The All-American 5 tubeless set, but this was an export set. It was set, it was, it was designed for export to Europe, um, where the voltage is 240 volts rather than, um, rather than the 110 volt. Now, the, the filament string in this set would be would was set up to use 110, 120 volts, so the set needed to to get rid of uh, about 120 volts of of, of 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 power before it could be used. Now, why uh, GE decided to try to to sell uh, an All American Five configuration in, where they needed to actually uh, throw away extra power is strange. Uh, don't quite understand why they did that. Um, why didn't they just put a transformer in and use a standard tube uh, lineup uh, with, a, with, a, with a transformer power? I don't understand that. Um, it's a very strange set. Uh, furthermore, uh, the set had to be modified to handle 240 volts. The, um, all the controls uh, you can see there's four dials on the front. Three of them were potentiometers, and then a, a, a multi-tap switch for the for multi-bands. All those all those um, controls needed to be isolated from the chassis. They're actually mounted on on uh, fiber boards um, and not connected to the chassis at all. The uh, the boards isolate the um, isolate the the potentiometers from the chassis and only the only the wire the only connection to the chassis is through the terminals on the potentiometers the 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 cases and the shafts are all isolated from from the power line now even stranger uh, on this particular set the um, power uh, this this set was an export model, which was then converted back for use in the United States, and they um, actually had uh, set this up for use with 110 volts. So what they did, they took a European set, converted it back to an American voltage. Very strange arrangement. I don't quite understand what GE had in mind. So that's it. Um, that's my that's my little show for today. Okay, guys, I think we're done. Thank you, Bill. That was uh, that was excellent. Quite a interesting set of different types of uh, radio architecture there. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, just when was that General Electric manufactured? What year? It's difficult to say. Um, the um, if 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 you go online, you can find it in radio in one of the radio museums. They list it as 1939, which I'm sure is incorrect. I believe by the styling and the the construction, it was probably late 40s or early 50s. Okay, but I well, can't confirm that. Uh, it's there's very little information available on that. Yeah, and if it was right before the war. Um, the possibility of why there is no transformer is copper back then was a uh, what's the word I'm looking for was a uh, it was wanted by the uh, armed forces for all their all their uh, wiring so copper was a premium back then and I think that's what you'll find out. That's I don't. I I don't think this. Well, this would have been. I think more more like the Korean War. 
It was uh, after. I don't think it was. I don't think this was 1939. What's the model I think number? This was of that? a 1950 set. What's that model number of the set again, please? I could. The model number X. It's X four five seven, and okay. it's listed uh, or the the name on the on the tag is GE International. Not just GE, but GE International. And uh, I was not, unable to find any schematic for it. And and, and the uh, other and there's not much had, other information available. The other comment that I had is on the was the second set. I can't remember what the uh, maker model was that you talked about, or maybe it was the third. It was an electrolytic capacitor that was in line with the uh, tube filaments. Now, you want to maintain 300 milliamps through those tubes. And if you bump up the capacitance when you, when you update your capacitors, uh, you want to stick as close as you can to the original value of that and not necessarily bump it up thinking it's going to be better because what you're going to do is change that current rating which could lead to premature filament burnouts on the tubes. That's right. all I want to say. Yeah, Phil, good, good, good comment. Phil, I got a question on the uh, X457 the GE, the last one you did. What, on the string of tubes for the heating elements, what does that total, just of the uh, heating elements, without whatever was used to drop the voltage from 200 volts down to whatever. Yeah, the heating elements are um, standard All-American 5, which would be about 120 volts. So well, that, 120 volts at uh, 150 milliamps. Then what did GE do to drop that voltage from... Uh, the 200 volts of European uh, voltage down oh, to... Oh, yeah. They, they, yeah, they put in a ballast resistor. They put okay. in um, a resistor, but um, it, it was just a simple ballast resistor. Now, the model that I worked on actually modification to European set. Very strange idea. I don't know why GE did that. So the they brought them back to this country, but uh, the um, the, the um, European model they, they, they dropped the resistor, and they dropped 120 volts on that, which um, comes out to be about 18 watts. That chassis or the the set must have been really hot. Because they had a series resistor uh, dissipating 18 watts of power. So the set didn't appear in the States till after it was marketed in Europe. Is that correct? Apparently, yeah. Yeah, I, that seems to be the case. Um, on this particular, the one, the particular one I worked on actually had a, a label on the inside of the cabinet uh, it actually had two labels. There was the European label, and pasted over that was the American label with the American voltage settings. So that this was apparently um, built for Europe, but then modified for American. Bill, thank you. So that was an excellent what presentation. He had in mind. Yeah, maybe they okay. didn't sell as maybe they didn't sell as well in Europe, so GE just decided to convert them back and try and sell them off in the States. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Bill. Any further questions for Bill? Well, we had three excellent presentations today. And at this point in the virtual forum, I always uh, put out a, a plea for more presentations. And Matt puts up a poll, which you can answer. And uh, please consider being a presenter. Uh, it's what makes this uh, forum such a great uh, thing to do on a Saturday morning, and it it's really a, a fun thing to do. If, if you haven't done it before, we can help you uh, get going. Um, today's a good example. Alan was a first-time presenter. We've had 
several first time presenters over the last 12 months. So please consider being a presenter. So um, before I take down that poll, I just want to remind everyone that both uh, Tom and I will help folks uh, with the PowerPoint or the tech aspects of putting together the presentation. So don't let that stop you. Okay. All right. Now that we've done the poll and we've concluded our presentations, we now go to the show and tell point, which um, you sometimes ask earlier in the forum whether anyone has a show and tell, and we didn't do that this time. But now is the time. If you have a show and tell you'd like to bring and spend maybe three to five minutes talking about it, uh, please come forward and do so. Say, I do. I do. Hello. Tell them who you are. I'm Anthony. Hello, Anthony. Welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks. I've got a video to show you. Okay. Okay, got to hold it up now. Look. That's awesome. Tell them what it is and when you got it. It's the old video I got for Christmas. Okay, tell them what kind it is. It's the Admiral. And what kind does it do? What does it do? It's a lunchbox video. That's me. Tell them about your collections that you collect on. I collect on radios. <laughs> well, that's cool. I think you're among friends here. Well, that's, what I'm looking for. that's what I'm looking for. Thanks. Was that portable radio pretty heavy? It looked like. You were having a little time living. <laughs> <laughs> and then the old radio. Yeah. They called it portable back then, but it would be if you were a a weightlifter or a sumo wrestler. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> thank you. How many radios do you have, Anthony? A lot of them. Oh lordy. I've got a lot of old do you want to my other old radio? Want you to stand stand up here and we'll move your chair. Are you ready? Yeah. This is just a little bit that's in his room. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's just a little bit of them. That's really cool. Another way to really help. That's a good zenith. Yeah. It looks too, he's got good quality sound. Got batteries on the side of it to make it work. Heavy batteries. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. Hey, thanks. Thanks. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Anthony. We're we're glad to have you as a member of the the virtual forum, and uh, please uh, come back again, visit with us. I will. All right. Thanks for sharing. That was great. Thank you. Here in Chicago area, come to the uh, come to the uh, Archie meetings. Yeah, we have a swap meet in two weeks. Where, that, where is that going to be? It's in uh, Carroll Stream, and uh, if you come to the Archie website, it'll tell you all about it. Okay, tell them yeah, where that. we live, Anthony. Um, we're in we're in Mason, Ohio. Oh, okay. We're Oops. just north of Cincinnati, and we're <laughs> only about four miles away from the Voice of America uh, Park and Museum. Oh, that's neat. How did you hear about this virtual forum? Um, I think, I think maybe I was looking up uh, one of the radios that he has, and um, it was online somewhere. Maybe radio. I look a lot up on Radio Museum on okay. the Radio Museum website. And I think I just dove into the rabbit hole and then I found you guys. <laughs> yeah, well, that's where we are. We're down in the rabbit hole. So. <laughs> are you... I just kept going until I found somebody that was, Yeah. and are I you... saw you guys were having this are you... pretty. Um... Are you in tune with Facebook? Well, that's great. Well, uh, you, uh, we'll get you on the mailing list. And so you'll, oh. we'll get invited to the next one because you're, you're registered with your email. So. We'll be able there's to also there's there's also a uh, a Facebook page as well too. Look up Antique Radio Club of Illinois. 
but the okay. Google chat, the Google chat's a little more involved. Okay, I certainly will. Yeah, either way, you'll see it for. Or, or you can just look up ARCI, the letters A R C I, and just put radio behind it, and it'll it'll pop up. Otherwise, you're going to get all kinds of ARCI stuff. Oh, okay. Not okay, that's great. Well, thanks again, Anthony, and uh, we'll we'll see if anyone else has a show and tell right now. Anybody? Well, in that case, at this point is when I uh, conclude the uh, taping part. So I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying thanks, everyone, for attending today, and we'll hope to see you again in March.